All states did. Okay, now, um, from the perspective of the front, or from the perspective that Isabella has from the back, she looks around and doesn't see a lot of saints. Because we see um, the sin that still uh, inhabits our lives and, and uh, our bodies in this life. Luther had a wonderful phrase for that. It was simo justus et peccator. At one and the same time, totally justified, yet sinner. And, and sinner. So the child of God in this life is both saint and sinner. Now one way to put that in your minds is to think of creation before the fall. Adam and Eve were saints of God. Perfect. Created in the image of God, they bore that image and they reflected that image perfectly. But since the fall, sin now inhabits us. And by the grace of God, through God's merit of, in Christ alone, we have forgiveness of sin, and therefore we are justified by grace through faith, as we heard last week, apart from the deeds of the law. So that's what Luther meant when he said we are both saint and sinner. Last Sunday, we, we heard the message proclaiming to us why we needed to have the pure gospel preached. And today, we see the results in the saintliness of that gospel being purely preached and rightly received by grace through faith. Let's join together in the prayer of the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Does anyone have any announcements that need to be made before the children take their leave? I know of none either other than we missed Pastor Peppercorn already this morning because there were no lists of who was going to be in the first service. <laughs> so we know who takes care of that. Don't we? Um, okay, uh, the, the Sunday school with Catherine? Yep. Okay. Come with me. And a youth with Mr. Wismar? Walt. Dennis, if you can't hear, flag me, would you please? Loud and clear, Pastor. Thank you. I'm trying to use my outside voice inside. And I don't know how long that's going to last. I'm not used to doing this. So today, we're going to uh, do as our Bible study, 1 Timothy. Or sorry, 2 Timothy. Um, 2 Timothy is known as a pastoral epistle. What does pastoral mean? What do we mean when we use that term pastoral epistle? Is it just for pastors? Mark says, no, I know that. <laughs> Don't say that kind of stuff to me. <laughs> I, I added the last part. Well, a pastoral epistle it's usually referring to those epistles that Paul wrote specifically to pastors of the church. And it's very interesting because Timothy 
was more of an experienced younger pastor, and Titus was more of an inexperienced older pastor. And uh, what I mean by that is pastoral experience, not life experience. Okay? And that there's a tremendous difference between those two things. So, for example, in 1 Timothy, uh, the Apostle Paul lays out a list of uh, qualifications for one who desires to be a bishop. Among them is not a novice, because Timothy was serving uh, the, the Church of our Lord in an area that was well established. And so, uh, Timothy was instructed not to put uh, a young person in charge of a congregation who was a new Christian. Okay? But when we get to Titus, Titus was serving uh, in, the, in the mission field, if I can use that term. And uh, because of that, you don't see that term, not a novice, in uh, Paul's uh, pastoral uh, injunction to Titus about who should serve in the office of a bishop. Everything else, almost identical. But, but that, that's kind of an interesting thing. So these are pastoral epistles, and we're going to look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1 and 2 Timothy 2. Before I do that, let me share with you what Luther has to say about uh, 2 Timothy. Luther said that Paul was writing this in his final imprisonment. He was in Rome, um, scheduled to be executed, if you if I can use that term, and he exhorts Timothy to go on preaching the gospel. Do what you've been doing. First Timothy, Paul expects to, to, to see Timothy again. Second Timothy, not so much. And we see that. But in spite of what Paul is facing, and in spite of what Timothy may be facing, he encourages him to remain faithful. To, to stick with what has been entrusted to you and distributed according to the mercy and grace of God. He points out that uh, this might be a time for people to fall away, but they are encouraged not to do so. And uh, to, to be alert for Satan's prowling around, uh, uh, around and um, to, to work at the gospel. Be an evangelist. That's what that term means, be a gospel person. And he also prophesies a little bit about what things will be like at the end of the world. Um, and Luther, as Luther is wont to do, points out that when we let earthly things crowd in the way or incorporate themselves into things spiritual, the devil will have a wild party. And that's kind of Luther's way of, of saying, this is happening. And um, I, I think we can see that in our day as well, where people have easily departed from the faith. With that in mind, and by the way, if you don't have a, a copy, there are some in the back of 2 Timothy chapters 1 and 2, which I will be doing this week and next, and then um, since... Uh, Things are evenly divided. Pastor Meyer gets weeks three and four to do uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 4. So let's take a look at the text. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I'm sure this is probably plowing fields that have already been plowed for you uh, well and truly, but especially in the apostolic epistles, uh, Paul does a very clever thing, as uh, Pastor Pepperborn mentioned a couple weeks ago, that the normal way of writing a letter at this time was greetings to, from, or better yet, from, to. So, um, Paul would say, much like memos might show up in our mailboxes today, from so-and-so to so-and-so, and then you get the topic, 
uh, if, if it's a more of a personal one, you'll get some sort of a greeting. And that was the normal structure for sending a letter in the time of the Apostle Paul. From Paul to Timothy, greetings. Except Paul does a very interesting thing. He changes one letter in the Greek word from greeting, and it becomes charis, grace. Instead of kari, it becomes charis. And so you have grace, grace and peace to you. Um, that's Paul's normal way of addressing. And he, he begins most of his epistles with his apostolic credentials. The Judaizers followed him around, not only questioning um, his gospel, as he calls it, his message, but also his credentials. He couldn't have been a real apostle because he persecuted the church of God. He couldn't have been a real apostle because they had to be with Jesus. Well, Paul had a personal tutoring with Jesus, as he describes in one of his epistles. So we don't have to let that trouble and worry us at all. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, that reminds us of several things. This is not a self-chosen vocation. Okay? It is a called vocation. Uh, 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 that's, that's using the same word twice. A called call. Well, of course it is. Um, uh, but it is a vocation, a, a, a putting, as Paul describes it in the first letter of Timothy, that God put me into this office. I didn't seek it, I didn't desire it, God put me there. And then he talks about what that, what that means. Life in Christ Jesus. And then to Timothy, my beloved child. Why might he be referring to Timothy as his child? Did he tutor him? Yeah. Tudor, younger, yeah, I think both of those things are true. He, he was with Paul on one of his missionary journeys, and we assume that Paul just didn't sit around doing this when he wasn't stitching uh, tents or preaching the gospel. He was probably teaching, whether he was teaching just Timothy or especially Timothy, that is, um, we would have a general teaching session and then maybe a tutoring session while Timothy was preparing meals or whatever the case may be, uh, helping Paul in some way, then uh, Paul would maybe further expand on what he had taught Timothy. He brings that Timothy was quite young, uh, especially to be uh, a, a bishop. And we note that in 1 Timothy already, Timothy is being told to appoint pastors in every place. Um, the term there used is elders, overseer, bishop, okay? And Timothy himself was a, an overseer, a bishop. Please. Would you also add in that because um, Timothy was originally taught by his mother and grandmother, you know, the faith, and then when Paul came along, he became the father to Timothy in that spiritual aspect, where Timothy first the father, you know, the, his, his mother husband. You know, he wasn't involved in the church, and then Paul kind of came into that. So Paul being with him for so long since Timothy was young up to where he is now, you know, there's that closeness that you get when you go to church, you know, with people in your life, in, in, a, in that sense as well. I, I can't comment on that. We know that his mother and his grandmother taught him the faith of the Old Testament. We don't know if that applies uh, in terms of who is the Christ. That becomes the key. Because the Old Testament said, you are saved by the Messiah, the anointed one of God. But who was that? And uh, the, the gospel proclaims that it's Christ. That, I think, is the, the main part. You can make applications all over the place. Paul, I think Paul is saying to Timothy, if you should Father, see the Son, I'm not going to be here, but you're going to carry on. There's Especially, there's, yeah. There's an inheritance here that the Paul yeah. sees it. Yeah, and, and he sees it even in the first epistle when he was in prison, but in Ephesus. 
and he was released after that. But I think I think Paul is right aware. I, I would kind of agree with that that he is seeing the end approaching of his earthly pilgrimage. Um, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, for your sake, it is better that I be here. That that sort of thing. I think that's true. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the introduction? Then we see all of those wonderful words there again. Grace. Mercy, peace. Grace, mercy, peace. God's, God's, um, how, how God views us is grace, mercy, how he deals with us, and peace, the results of what transpired when we understand we are no longer at war with God. Because sin separates us, puts us at war with God. So we have that grace, mercy, peace. And um, that, that I, I would encourage all of us to remember that in the next week especially. But always, it's always good to remember it. But um, this coming week, I, I don't think we're going to believe we have peace. And we may not have worldly peace. And it really doesn't matter. Because we do have peace. And that peace does not come from uh, the outside world, it comes from God through Christ. This reconciliation, this putting back together what sin has separated. Then in verse 3, uh, any other questions on in the intro? No, then let's go on. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and days. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Um, again, Paul is probably calling to mind the times when Timothy had to depart from him and th there was the same kind of emotional experience that many of us have when we depart from loved ones, um, whether it's temporary or, or more, more permanent. Um, when children move many states away, that, that used to be, um, when, I was, when I was younger, um, that, that used to be quite a challenge for parents yeah. who had never, never been on an airplane. And one of my sisters had the audacity to move to Australia. And I remember the first time my parents went to visit her. Um, it's, uh, from Minnesota, it's about a 30-hour plane ride, counting the layover in LA or San Francisco to get there. It, it was not one of their most uh, exciting experiences in life. And because they were people who went through the Depression business class and first class was not something that they understood. It was, what is the cheapest ticket we can possibly get? And so they probably sat like this, you know, for 15 hours in the back of the plane. Um, that, that, that's quite a challenge for people sometimes. And I'm sure there were many tears of joy upon arrival and many tears of, of sorrow upon departure. I am reminded of your sincere faith. What does this mean? I'm Lutheran. I need to know these things. <laughs> what does this mean? Donna, welcome back. How's the, how's the shoulder? It's there. Okay. <laughs> Better than not being there, I suspect. Yeah. Anyone? What is a sincere faith? An honest faith. An honest faith? Okay. A genuine faith. Genuine? Versus phony. <laughs> yeah, it, isn't it interesting how most often when we talk about the things of God, we have to do it in contrasts. You know, uh, a sincere smile versus an insincere smile. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about God, we don't use those terms, but when we talk about ourselves, 
because of sin, we find ourselves using that kind of thing. Um, love, hate, confess, deny, uh, sincere faith, phony faith, hypocritical faith. Um, what's the difference between Paul talking to Timothy with that, with that um, term sincere in the text? What's he trying to get at? Dennis? Um, my reference Bible sent me to 1 Timothy 4.14 and it says, do not neglect the gift you have, which you have given to you by prophecy when the council of elders lay their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. How many of you have been at an ordination or an installation of a pastor? Okay, most all of them, at least a good number. Um, oftentimes, in an ordination, the pastors will gather around and put their hands, laying hands on someone. That's oftentimes a synonym for ordination. When one is put into public service for the first time, one is ordained. And this this goes back to apostolic times, and it is done even today. Um, when someone is put into, uh, into a vocation in a particular congregation, such as when Pastor Peppercorn was installed here, or Pastor Meyer, I, I was at the second installation. I don't remember if I was at the first one or not. Martin Paddy was, I remember. I don't think I may. Um, but the second installation of Pastor Meyer, we did not lay our hands on him, but we did something else. And what did we do? Does anyone recall? Both for Pastor Meyer and, and Pastor Pepper? Yes? You exhorted him. We exhorted him. With what? <laughs> with much speaking? With the word of God. With the word of God. And uh, pastors will offer uh, a particular passage or passages. In, in the old days, uh, when I first was a pastor, we, we picked our own texts. Nowadays, we are normally assigned a text by the presiding pastor, whether it's the district president or the circuit counselor or the parish pastor, um, for decency and an order. Um, I always like to go first when I was young to make sure I get mine in because the older people knew more than one, and I only knew one or two. And I figured if I waited to the end, they'll all get theirs in, and I won't have anything to say. Um, yeah. So um, decency and order is a good thing. And at that time, when one is put into office, there also there's something else that takes place, and that is prayers. That. All of these passages are put together before God and um, given as gift, if you will, to the candidate who is to be put into office. And the Holy Spirit takes them in prayer form before the Father who is in heaven. And so these two things are taking place. So stir up that gift. And how does that gift come? Through the Word of God. And that is how it is stirred up. To, to bring to your mind, recall, bring it back, continue in that process. Not, not something foreign to that. Any other comments or questions? Thank you uh, for that. Howard. No, it says that your Timothy, your faith, but really it was given to him. So part of the, being able to say a sincere faith Okay, I don't think I can dispute that, but you can take the word sincere away, and faith still must have an object. Yeah. It always has to be Jesus Christ. Um, I may have faith in the future, but if that doesn't involve Jesus Christ, what good does it do me? Okay, then the object is the future, 
and not and not Jesus Christ. So as long as Christ is the object, we're okay. I have Barbara. another answer. Okay. <laughs> um, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it says, For the Timothy. 
And um, th those of you who know your large and small catechism from memory probably remember how Luther begins his introduction. The Ten Commandments, he says, as the head of the household should teach his family. That, that's, that's the job of parents, to see that their children are tough. Grandmother and mother, yes, way in the back there, Heather. So I'm the head of my household. Pardon? I'm the head of my household. How does that die? You are the head of the household. Okay. Yes. <laughs> As the head of the household should teach his family. You have to be the head and the recipient. So okay. you have to do twice as much. So I'll expect you here at every Bible class, you know. Okay, not just the ones for women. But I think here the content of, of, the, of the teaching is, is what Paul is talking about. This faith mom and grandmother pointed to the Messiah. They were Hebrews until Christ came. And then, now they have heard who that Messiah is. Jesus is the Christ. As Peter confessed uh, in, uh, confesses in Matthew 16. And so, now we know who the Christ is. And in the early community, when you read through some of Paul's epistles, when they come and say, do you have the baptism of John or do you have a different baptism? We don't know about this baptism in the name of Jesus. How is that different from John's baptism? Well, the content is there now. John was baptizing to or toward the one who would come and redeem. And the baptism that we now call the Trinitarian baptism or baptism in the name of Jesus is baptized into that Messiah, that Christ, that Son of the living God, and the Father who sent him. And now I am sure, Paul says, dwells in you. Here is where, uh, and that statement you made about the confidence comes out. There it is, okay? Um, For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, biblical scholars have debated this, um, and especially in the last 150 years, since uh, charismaticism and Pentecostalism have become more prominent, what that means through the laying on of my hands. But we don't have time to get into a full explanation of that in this class, but, uh, in this brief hour. But I do think we can say these things. In the early Christian community, on the day of Pentecost, God provided manifestations of the working of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people through what uh, uh, the apostles call spiritual gifts. Gifts of healing, gifts of speaking in unlearned language, gifts of interpreting in unlearned language, and so on and so forth. And the purpose of these gifts was threefold. One, to authenticate the message of the gospel because there was, at this time, not that book that we call the New Testament. That's its first purpose. Second, it was there to proclaim the gospel so that the gospel could be heard and understood even by people who didn't understand English, if I am speaking. That someone could interpret uh, their, their native tongue. This we hear already in the day of Pentecost. How is it that we each hear in our own native language this message? How is that happening? Well, whether it was a single miracle or a double miracle, I don't know. In other words, I don't know if, if someone was translating or if they heard in a language that was not their native tongue. They heard it in that native tongue. Um, 
But th that kind of spiritual gift was there to authenticate the message and the messenger and to proclaim Christ and the gospel. And so um, it also indicated that these people had heard the gospel message. And for, for example, for Peter uh, and at Cornelius, the people began uh, manifesting these so-called miraculous Pentecostal day gifts. And Peter says, well, then how can we withhold baptism from them if the Holy Spirit has already come to them? And so on and so forth. So um, the other thing I would point out is in the book of Acts, um, the spiritual gifts are given in one of two ways. Through the preaching of an apostle or through the laying on of apostolic hands. Only those two ways. And they're not there referring to ordination, I don't believe. Because this is Simon, uh, I, I forget the, the verse, I think it's chapter 8, where Simon the sorcerer hears the message in Acts and um, he, 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 he believes in Jesus, but then he wants the ability to give that gift. And he comes to the apostles and offers money. Because this would make him a big dude. He, he would be way up there in the magician's world if he could give these gifts. And um, he is called to repentance in no sure, short form. But I think, if I remember correctly, the text goes, and when Simon saw that the gift was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And the only other place we see that gift given is through the preaching of the apostle Peter. So those two methods of com communicating these spiritual gifts, I think, fall again into the category of telling us why. They're for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. Not for any other purpose. To authenticate that the message is real. And by the way, if they come only through the apostles, when did the last apostle cease? Die. Earthly death. It was John. Probably in, in early uh, hundreds, if I can use that term. Uh, some time and then I believe he was at least 90 if not older by the time he died um, and within 20 years of that time another spirit led miracle in my mind took place and that is the language that the New Testament was penned in ceased to be a common language Koine Greek ceased to be the language of commerce and Latin takes over in about 125 AD, within, uh, within 15, 10, 15 years of the New Testament canon being totally completed in Greek. The great advantage of that is the language doesn't change. It hasn't changed since the time of the New Testament. Latin has changed. English has changed. I remember when gay was a good thing. Okay? And various other terms that we, we throw around today or don't. You know, it's just totally different meaning. Um, and by the way, it's not just, it's in liturgical uh, use too. If you are old enough to have in your uh, hymnal collection uh, a 1917 copy of the first English version of the Lutheran hymnal, and you look at at uh, Vespers, it will say, uh, let my prayers prevent thee as incense. <laughs> let my prayers prevent you as incense. Today we say, let my prayers rise before you as incense. But the early English translation in the Missouri Synod said prevent. Why? Because it came from the Latin word they're waiting to come before, to proceed before. Okay? Intercession? Pardon? Intercession? Well, prayer is always intercession. But prevent, 
Today means a whole nother thing. Prevent means to stop something from occurring. That's its primary use today. Not to come before something that follows. Okay? And so we were saying, let my prayers come before your citizens in the same way uh, that we, we, we use them today. Okay, verse, verse uh, what is it, 8? Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus as the ages begin. So we'll, let's pause there for a moment. Here Paul is giving a summation of his ministry. This is what it's about. It's the power of God who called us to a holy calling, saved us, not by our works, but because of his mercy, his grace. And all of this flows through Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. So Paul is here saying, look, I know why I'm in this fix. I know why I'm being persecuted. I know why I'm sitting in death row because the Lord appointed me to do this. And he tells Paul that through Ananias, you will suffer much for my name's sake. And so he does. He's a proclaimer of the gospel. He's an apostle. He is a teacher of the faith. And here, when we use that term teacher of the faith, we're speaking about teaching again. The faith must be taught in the home and in the community of the faith. Those are the two primary places. And by the way, parents, just a little aside, I've always thought one of the great ways for parents to teach their children the meaning of the gospel is to use the words, I'm sorry and I forgive you what to one another in front of the children. I don't think there's anything you can do that will teach the gospel and the forgiveness of sins more completely, more succinctly to your children and grandchildren than that. So say the words. Don't take it for granted. And don't ever say, oh, it's okay. It's not okay. Somebody paid big for that mistake. Okay? And I have called it into question uh, by separating us by my activity. Any questions on that section? This is one of Paul's favorite words, I am not ashamed, in the book of Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And here, I am not, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believe. And here I think Paul is talking about um, the, the, the revelation given to him from God through the Son by the Spirit. And that reveals always Jesus Christ. That's where Paul's belief is centered. And it's very interesting because here in this particular section the words faith and belief are kind of turned around from the way we normally think of them. We normally think of belief as a structure of doctrine, and yet um, uh, here he talks about in verse um, uh, 6 and so on, he talks about the faith from your grandmother Lois and Eunice, uh, your mother Eunice and so on. He's talking here about the content, the, the, the teaching about that thing, which normally we talk about this is what I believe as we do in the creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Christian Church. And so on. Uh, but here Paul uses those terms interchangeably. Turns them around. Uh, Pastor Meyer, do you happen to have your Greek in front of you? I do not. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> they, they are different terms. And what, what does it say? Is, are they the same terms? Or is it an English translation? Well, faith, it's this in, in uh, verse um, 8. Eight. Okay, sorry, we're jumping. No, six. 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 No, it's there. Um, it's this, okay. Um, then how, how about yeah. uh, how about in whom I have believed? That's in verse 12. Wait, sorry, let me look at this. I'm sorry, that's the wrong word. Um, it is, faith is not verse 6. There is no word faith in verse 6. No, eight. Eight. Oh, okay, sorry. That no, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> I am reminded of your sincere faith. I think that's... No, that, that's there. It's there. It's just there. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, sincere faith, verse 5. And therefore, in, uh, in 12, which is why I suffer as I do, for I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Yeah, it's... it's uh, Oh, so it is the same term. They are just using them to make it different for us for whatever reason. Uh, here it's talking about, I know in whom my faith has been placed. Probably a better translation of the Greek in verse uh, 12. That's what Paul is saying. <coughs> because it is tied back to this, this doctrine, this teaching that has come down, passed down from grandmother to mother to grandson and son uh, uh, strengthened by the apostle and so on. And so he's, he's really encouraging Timothy here um, not to feel sorry for it, for what he's facing because this is what comes to those who are faithful. And then he goes on to say, I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. What is that day? What does Paul have in mind? The appearing of Jesus. Uh, yeah. Can we say that a little more succinctly? The final the coming judgment. of Jesus. Yeah. The last judgment. Um, the final coming of Jesus. Um, this is a little particular peeve of mine, so bear with me. I don't... I, I get nervous when people talk about the second coming uh, instead of the final coming. Why would I do that? Well, how many of you were in the first service? How many of you received Christ through word and body and blood? Did he come to you? Yes. Then that's not the second coming. Okay? That's all I'm saying. It makes me nervous. I don't, I don't like to I don't like to get nervous. <laughs> I can't. Um, when, when, we, when I hear that term second coming, referring to his final coming. So, just that's my pet peeve. You don't have to have it. And I admit it's just mine. All mine. Um, and so he, he is going to guard me uh, until that day, what has been entrusted to me. And on that day, is it about time, young Paul? Okay, let me finish the last uh, section here. Um, follow the pattern of sound words that have been heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And on, on this day of all days, All Saints Day, it is very fitting that, that we should have this particular text today. Uh, because we think today, uh, at least I did, uh, not only of my mother and father, who are now uh, sainted spiritually, awaiting the resurrection of the body for our, at our Lord's final coming, but of many in the faith who have been very important to me. Um, 
And I, uh, when, when we sing that hymn, that uh, final communion hymn in the first service, the second hymn, communion hymn, um, uh, about the, the, the saints who come in right the grave, um, they, they are gathered here, as Pastor Meyer said in his sermon. They are gathered here with us. We don't see them. The whole company of heaven is here. Angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. And among those that I often think of, there are two that jump out at me. Um, uh, Martin Taddy, Reverend Martin Taddy, who was, uh, I can say, my mentor here uh, when I first came to California uh, at Grace San Mateo. He was at Trinity Palo Alto and my uh, counselor uh, at the time, my circuit visitor, as we call him today, and Dr. Robert Kreutz, uh, because that was his favorite, one of his favorite hymns. And um, uh, because it's Norwegian, what can I say? <laughs> Maybe that's why, but it, it's a beautiful hymn and teaches the faith very well. And so when we gather, even though we are scattered now in our gathering, we are no longer gathered around the throne of God, the, the altar of God. Uh, well, as we normally do, still visualize that with us are the whole company of the faith. Those who have fought the fight and kept the faith. Thanks be to God. And it is a joy to be part and parcel of that. Any other quick comments? Or comments? Great. Sound word. Yeah, I will have to practice my speed up, and um, so I, I'm not used to doing that so much anymore. So forgive me. I will do that. We'll, we'll pick up those two paragraphs next time and then get into chapter two, because Pastor Byron has three and four, so I have to finish by next time. <laughs> we depart with the apostolic benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.